We tend to think about medieval people as being real prudes. However, they're interested in all kinds of sex and romance that we would find completely unacceptable. In the tapestry of history, the medieval period is often shrouded in myths, misunderstandings, and half-truths. Among its many facets, the realm of sexuality is one that has been both romanticized and stigmatized. While the Middle Ages spanned vast regions and diverse cultures, certain patterns of understanding and practicing sexuality emerged. This video delves into 20 distinct facets of sex during the medieval era, unearthing the realities, beliefs, and practices of a time long past. Number 1. Marriage and Age of Consent In the medieval period, marriage was not only a spiritual union but also a socio-economic arrangement. In Europe, Marital alliances often consolidated power, secured lands, or built advantageous relationships between noble families. This context significantly influenced the age at which individuals were married off. During the early medieval period, the age of consent was not universally standardized and was contingent upon local customs, religious dictates, and the socioeconomic needs of the families involved. By the late medieval period, Canon law, the law of the Catholic Church, established 12 as the minimum age for marriage for girls and 14 for boys. However, it's crucial to understand that while these ages were legally recognized, it didn't necessarily mean consummation occurred immediately. Many times, especially among the nobility, young brides and grooms were formally married but would only live together or consummate the marriage when they were older. Public opinion varied. Some believed that early marriages, especially for girls, ensured chastity and virtue. In contrast, others argued for marriages at older ages, suggesting it ensured better health for mothers and children. The disparity between the legal age of marriage and the age of consummation was often bridged by betrothals, where couples were promised to each other but waited years before living together as husband and wife. Number 2. Chastity Belts – Myth or Reality the chastity belt, often depicted in popular culture, is a metal device designed to prevent sexual intercourse and is often associated with the medieval period. Its image is rooted deeply in the idea of controlling a woman's chastity, either when her husband was away or as a means of enforcing fidelity. However, the reality of the chastity belt is more complex than popular depictions suggest. There is little concrete evidence to suggest that these devices were widely used during the medieval ages. Most of the ancient chastity belts displayed in museums have been proven to be either 19th century forgeries or, at best, a post-medieval curiosity. It's believed that many of these were created in more recent times to feed the Victorian era's fascination with the barbaric Middle Ages. Mentions of chastity belts in medieval texts are scarce and are often ambiguous. When they are mentioned, it's typically in allegorical or metaphorical contexts, not as actual devices. While it's not impossible that some form of chastity-preserving device existed in isolated instances, the idea of widespread use during the medieval period is more myth than reality. The story of the chastity belt in many ways reflects our own modern misconceptions about the medieval world rather than genuine practices from the era. Number 3. The Church's Stance on Sexuality the Catholic Church wielded significant influence during the medieval period, and its doctrines often permeated societal values and norms. Concerning sexuality, the Church's stance was complex. On the one hand, it recognized the sanctity of marital unions and deemed sexual relations within marriage as necessary for procreation. Yet, it also held that the act was inherently sinful due to the pleasure associated with it. Sexual acts were only deemed permissible within the confines of a sacramental marriage and solely for the purpose of producing offspring. Acts driven by lust, even within a marital setting, were considered venial sins. This perspective was rooted in writings from early church fathers such as Augustine, who believed that the original sin of Adam and Eve brought lust into the world. Celibacy was greatly esteemed, and many religious figures championed the virtues of virginity. Monastic lifestyles, where individuals vowed to abstain from all sexual activities, were held in high regard. This reverence for celibacy underpinned the requirement for clergy members to remain unmarried and sexually abstinent. 
While the church's official stance was restrictive, in practice, lay people's adherence to these teachings varied widely. Confessionals became spaces where individuals discussed their sexual transgressions, seeking penance and guidance. Number four, concept of courtly love. Emerging in the high Middle Ages, the concept of courtly love radically transformed the way romantic love was perceived and expressed. This idealized form of love was characterized by chivalrous knights displaying undying devotion, usually to an unattainable noblewoman, often married to another man. This love was passionate yet unconsummated, placing emotional and spiritual connection above physical desires. Courtly love's literature, most notably the troubadour poems of southern France, depicted scenarios where a brave knight performed heroic deeds driven by his unyielding love for a lady. These tales highlighted love's ennobling qualities, suggesting that this profound emotion could elevate a person's character and moral standing. However, it's important to note that courtly love was, largely, a literary and artistic construct, serving as a counterpoint to the often transactional nature of medieval marriages. While courtly love ideals influenced some real-life behaviors and societal norms, they primarily existed in stories, songs, and artworks. The tension between the unattainable nature of courtly love and the pragmatic realities of medieval marital relations added layers of depth to the era's cultural expressions, providing a rich tapestry of romance, longing, and desire. Number 5. Prostitution and Brothels in Medieval Europe Prostitution, often termed the oldest profession, was a complex and multifaceted institution in medieval Europe. Despite the Church's teachings on sexual purity, prostitution persisted and even flourished in many urban centers. Cities such as Paris, Venice, and Florence had notable red-light districts. Medieval society viewed prostitution as a necessary evil, a way to curb potential threats to societal order, such as sodomy or rape, by providing an outlet for uncontrollable male sexual desires. Brothels, known in some regions as stew houses, were often licensed and regulated by municipal authorities. They paid taxes, and in some cases the revenue was used to fund public projects such as bridges or roads. Regulations might dictate where brothels could be located, the hours they could operate, and health measures to prevent the spread of disease. While some prostitutes worked independently, Many were tied to brothels where they lived and worked under the oversight of a madam or brothel keeper. It's crucial to note that while some women might have chosen this profession due to limited economic options, others were forced into it against their will. Prostitution in medieval Europe, as with many eras and cultures, was marked by both agency and exploitation. Number 6. The View on Homosexuality Homosexuality in medieval Europe was a subject of profound contention, primarily influenced by religious beliefs. The church denounced same-sex relationships, citing biblical passages and the writings of church fathers. Homosexual acts, particularly between men, were deemed unnatural and were associated with various punishments, ranging from excommunication to, in some regions, execution. Throughout much of the Middle Ages, the term sodomy was used to describe a range of non-procreative sexual activities, including homosexual acts. The ambiguity of the term meant that actual practices and beliefs varied greatly across regions and periods. For instance, while some areas witnessed aggressive persecution of homosexual individuals, others were more lenient or inconsistent in their enforcement of anti-sodomy laws. It's worth mentioning that while homosexual acts were condemned, deep and passionate friendships between individuals of the same gender were celebrated in various medieval texts and artworks. Such relationships often straddled the line between platonic and romantic, revealing the fluidity of human connections in the medieval mindset. Number 7. Birth Control Methods In the vast span of the medieval era, Birth control methods were rudimentary, influenced by a mix of folk remedies, ancient knowledge, and superstition. The church, advocating procreation within marital unions, largely frowned upon intentional prevention of conception. However, the necessity of managing family size, especially in resource-scarce settings, led people to seek clandestine solutions. One common method was coitus interruptus, where the man withdraws before ejaculation. Herbal remedies were also sought after, with certain plants believed to have contraceptive or abortifacient properties. 
Queen Anne's lace, wild carrot, for instance, was ingested as it was believed to prevent pregnancy. Other botanicals, such as pennyroyal, tansy, and juniper, were known to be used in attempts to induce miscarriage. Linen or animal intestine sheaths, precursors to modern condoms, were employed, though their usage was more for protection against diseases than as contraceptives. Pessaries, objects or concoctions inserted into the vagina to block or kill sperm, made from various substances like honey and acacia, were also used. It's vital to understand that many of these methods were not only unreliable, but could also be harmful. Knowledge about effective contraception was limited, and many practices were based on trial and error, leading to a higher rate of unintended pregnancies and risks associated with abortive methods. Number 8. Illegitimacy and bastardy. In medieval Europe, birth outside of wedlock carried significant social implications. Bastards, as they were commonly known, often faced legal and societal disadvantages. Their status was a product of the era's emphasis on lineage, inheritance, and the sanctity of the marital bond. While children born within marriage were automatically entitled to inherit their parents' property and titles, illegitimate children were usually excluded. In noble and royal families where lineage was paramount, illegitimate offspring could be a source of scandal. However, it wasn't unheard of for some nobles or monarchs to acknowledge and even favor their illegitimate children, occasionally granting them titles or lands, though they were typically excluded from primary inheritances. The societal perception of illegitimacy also varied based on local customs and specific circumstances. In some areas and among certain classes, the birth of a child out of wedlock might be met with a shrug, especially if the parents later married. In other situations, especially in stricter religious communities, it could result in significant stigmatization for both the mother and child. Number 9. Sexual Health and Diseases The medieval understanding of sexual health and diseases was framed within the limited medical knowledge of the time, heavily influenced by religious beliefs and ancient texts. The humoral theory, originating from Greco-Roman medicine, posited that the body consisted of four humors whose balance dictated health. Imbalances, even in sexual health, were often attributed to these humors. Sexually transmitted infections, though not understood as they are today, were acknowledged as diseases stemming from sexual contact. One of the most devastating was syphilis, which emerged in Europe in the late medieval period, causing significant social and medical concern. Its symptoms, ranging from sores to more severe neurological complications, were often treated with mercury, a method more toxic than curative. Gonorrhea, referred to in some texts as the clap, was another recognized ailment, though its exact cause remained a mystery. Treatments varied, involving herbal concoctions, bloodletting, and other practices rooted in traditional medicine. While the church emphasized chastity outside of marriage as a safeguard against such diseases, the real preventative measures like hygiene or effective treatments were poorly understood. This lack of awareness, combined with frequent travels and trade, meant that outbreaks of sexually transmitted diseases could rapidly affect large populations, leading to both health and social implications. Number 10. Adultery and its Consequences in the tightly knit fabric of medieval society, adultery was more than a personal transgression. It was a breach of social and often legal codes. The act threatened the lineage's purity, a critical concern in a world where inheritance, title, and family honor were paramount. Church doctrines unequivocally condemned adultery. In many regions, it was not just a sin, but also a crime, punishable by various means. Penalties ranged from public shaming, where the adulterer might be paraded through the town wearing a symbol of their transgression, to more severe punishments like flogging, exile, or even execution. For women, the consequences were disproportionately severe. While men might face penalties, women accused of adultery risked harsher punishments and deeper social ostracization. The act tainted their honor and by extension that of their families. A woman's value, often linked to her chastity and marital fidelity, could be irreparably damaged by even rumors of infidelity. Within the feudal system, a lord held significant rights over his vassals and their families. There were instances where lords claimed the droit de seigneur, or right of the lord, believed to be the right to sleep with a vassal's bride on her wedding night. However, 
The historical accuracy of this claim is debated among historians. Number 11. Rituals Surrounding Virginity Virginity, particularly in women, held immense symbolic and tangible value in medieval Europe. Rooted in religious teachings, societal norms, and economic concerns, a woman's virginity was often equated with her virtue and honor. The intact hymen, though not an accurate measure of virginity, became an emblem of purity and innocence. The wedding night was steeped in rituals highlighting the bride's virginity. In many regions, the consummation was a semi-public affair, with evidence of the bride's virginity, such as blood-stained sheets, occasionally displayed or examined by family or community members to confirm the act and her status. Religious orders especially revered virgins. Many female saints were venerated for their virginity and the miracles associated with their chastity. Convents became sanctuaries for women who chose a life of celibacy, dedicating themselves to spiritual pursuits, though some were placed there for economic or social reasons. Virgin martyrs like St. Agnes or St. Lucy were celebrated for choosing death over renouncing their faith or their virginity. Their stories, propagated through hagiographies, reinforced the paramount value of virginity and the ultimate sacrifices made to preserve it. Number 12. Sexual Education and Knowledge Medieval sexual education was a far cry from contemporary understandings. Knowledge was passed down through generations, primarily via oral traditions, familial guidance, and observation. While formal education systems existed, they were limited in scope and reach, leaving most without access to structured learning about sexuality. Medical texts, influenced by Greco-Roman works, offered some insights, though their circulation was restricted. Galen and Hippocrates' writings, which provided foundational medical knowledge, had sections discussing reproduction and sexual health, albeit through the lens of humoral theory. Religious institutions, primarily the church, played a crucial role in disseminating sexual knowledge. Sermons, confessionals, and pastoral care manuals addressed various sexual topics, albeit with a moralistic tone. While the emphasis was on abstinence, sin, and redemption, these interactions provided some rudimentary understanding of sexuality. Folk wisdom, midwives, and older community members often became the primary sources of sexual education for many. They passed down knowledge on conception, childbirth, and herbal remedies related to reproductive health. Still, given the era's limited scientific understanding, this education was a mix of practical advice, superstition, and myth. Number 13. The Role of Sex in Medieval Literature Medieval literature, spanning various genres, often showcased a complex dance of societal mores, religious directives, and raw human emotion. Within this dance, sexuality found a prominent stage. The exploration of desire, restraint, morality, and consequence wove its way through tales that ranged from devoutly religious to openly erotic. The chivalric tales of knights and their noble quests frequently touched upon the theme of courtly love. This was a form of love characterized by emotional and spiritual intensity, often unconsummated and directed towards an unattainable or married lady. Works such as Lancelot, the Knight of the Cart, by Chrétien de Troyes, highlighted the internal conflicts of passion versus duty. Geoffrey Chaucer's magnum opus, The Canterbury Tales, presented a spectrum of medieval society's views on sex. From the spirited account of the wife of Bath, who unabashedly discussed her five husbands and her assertive views on marital relations, to the more sobering tale of the noble Griselda who endured the cruel tests of her husband's affections, sexuality was a recurrent theme. Number 14. Marital Duties and Rights Marriage in the medieval period was both a sacred vow and a contractual commitment. Deeply entrenched in societal norms, legal directives, and religious tenets. The balance of marital duties and rights shifted throughout the period, influenced by cultural, social, and religious changes. Central to marital duties was the idea of consortium, a mutual obligation to provide comfort, company, and, crucially, conjugal relations. This concept of marital debt meant that neither spouse could arbitrarily deny intimacy to the other. Refusal without valid reasons, such as illness or religious observance, could potentially lead to ecclesiastical intervention. Such views, found in canonical documents like the Decretum of Gratian, 
highlight the medieval church's surprisingly progressive stance on the mutual sexual rights within marriage. However, the marital bed's duties were not merely about pleasure or procreation. In many medieval jurisdictions, the consummation cemented a marriage, making it legally indissoluble. Without consummation, the union could potentially be annulled, underlining the act's legal significance. Number 15. Medieval Erotic Art and Symbolism In the vast and intricate canvas of medieval art, eroticism and symbolism wove together in intricate patterns, reflecting a society that, while often outwardly pious, retained a profound connection to the corporeal and the sensual. Contrary to popular belief, the Middle Ages were not devoid of artistic representations of human desire. At the intersection of religion and eroticism, one finds the Sheila Nagigs, stone carvings of naked women displaying exaggerated genitalia found on churches and castles, primarily in Ireland and Britain. Their purpose remains debated. Fertility symbols, warnings against lust, or remnants of pre-Christian pagan practices. Manuscript illuminations, particularly in secular texts, occasionally showcased explicit scenes. These were not mere frivolities. Often they contained moral lessons, illustrating the perils of unbridled passion or the transient nature of earthly pleasures. In some cases, erotic scenes in the margins of religious texts might have been intended to test the reader's focus or serve as a reminder of worldly temptations. Symbols, often borrowed from nature, were rife with sexual connotations. The unicorn, frequently depicted in medieval tapestries, pursuing or being tamed by a maiden, has been interpreted as a symbol of virginal purity or masculine lust. Similarly, the fruit, especially the pomegranate with its abundant seeds, became synonymous with fertility. Number 16. Sexual Superstitions and Beliefs The medieval period, with its blend of religious fervor and limited scientific understanding, was rife with superstitions about sexuality. The moon's phases, for instance, were believed to influence fertility, with certain nights deemed more auspicious for conception. Creatures like the mandrake root, resembling the human form, were linked with potent sexual powers and were sought after as aphrodisiacs or fertility enhancers. Another widespread belief was that certain foods or spices could influence one's virility or fertility. Consuming certain animal parts, like the testicles of a bull, was thought to boost masculine prowess. Conversely, ailments related to sexuality, such as impotence, were sometimes attributed to witchcraft or malevolent spells. In cases where a couple couldn't conceive, rituals or pilgrimages might be undertaken to solicit divine intervention. Dream interpretations also held weight. Erotic dreams might be seen as omens or warnings, depending on the context. And in some communities, the act of sneezing during intimate moments was seen as a protective measure against evil spirits. Number 17. Role of the Clergy and Sexual Misconduct The medieval clergy, despite vows of celibacy, were not immune to the complexities of human sexuality. The Church, emphasizing chastity and purity, often faced challenges in ensuring that its clerical members upheld these ideals. Records from ecclesiastical courts and penitential manuals reveal instances of clergy involved in both heterosexual and homosexual liaisons. Monastic settings, despite their insular nature, were not entirely devoid of sexual transgressions. Tales of secret trysts or relationships occasionally surfaced, leading to scandals. The church's responses varied, with some transgressors subjected to penances, while others faced expulsion from their orders. The issue of clerical misconduct was not merely a matter of personal failings. It bore significant implications for the church's moral authority. Repeated incidents or scandals risked undermining the institution's credibility and its spiritual mandate. While the majority of clerics likely upheld their vows with sincerity, the instances of misconduct served as a poignant reminder of the challenges the medieval church faced in navigating the intersection of human frailty and spiritual aspirations. Number 18. Laws and Regulations Surrounding Sex Medieval society, underpinned by a fusion of religious doctrines and the needs of social order, had a comprehensive set of laws and regulations governing sexuality. While the ecclesiastical courts oversaw matters of sin, secular courts dealt with legal transgressions. Adultery, for example, could lead to penance from the church and fines or public shaming by local authorities. 
In some regions, laws against fornication were so strict that even engaged couples could be penalized if they were intimate before marriage. Laws also dictated the legality of certain unions. Marriages between close relatives, even distant cousins in some jurisdictions, were prohibited. Such unions, if discovered, could be annulled. Similarly, clandestine marriages, undertaken without witnesses or proper ceremonies, faced legal scrutiny. Same-sex relationships, particularly among men, were viewed with stringent disdain. While attitudes varied across regions, many places had punitive laws. The infamous sodomite or buggery laws could lead to severe penalties, including death in extreme cases. Number 19. Cultural Variations in Sexual Norms Medieval Europe, though often perceived as monolithic, was a mosaic of diverse cultures, each with its nuances in sexual norms. For instance, while Northern European societies might stress on a bride's virginity, some Southern European cultures placed a higher emphasis on lineage and dowry. The Celtic traditions of Ireland and Scotland, with their Brecon laws, often had more egalitarian views on women's rights and sexuality compared to their English counterparts. In contrast, Spain, with its unique history of Christian, Jewish, and Muslim coexistence, showcased an amalgamation of sexual norms and attitudes. Vikings, known for their seafaring exploits, had distinct rituals surrounding marriage, fidelity, and even divorce. Their sagas, rich in tales of passion and betrayal, offer a window into their sexual ethos. Number 20. Medieval Sex Scandals and Controversies The medieval era, despite its veneer of piety and restraint, was not devoid of salacious incidents and controversies, often involving the period's most notable figures. Perhaps the most infamous of these surrounds Eleanor of Aquitaine. Initially married to King Louis VII of France, their union was annulled, allegedly due to Eleanor's rumored affairs, including one with her uncle, Raymond of Antioch. She subsequently married Henry II of England, but their tumultuous relationship and her involvement in inciting their sons against their father added to her controversial image. The Knights Templar, once the most powerful military order in Christendom, faced allegations of heresy, idol worship, and homosexual practices. While many historians believe these charges were fabricated to suppress the order and seize its wealth, the accusations and the subsequent trials sent shockwaves throughout medieval Europe. Pope Alexander VI, originally Rodrigo Borgia, is another figure synonymous with scandal. His pontificate was riddled with allegations of nepotism, bribery, and illicit relationships. The tales of his affairs and the resultant offspring, including the notorious Cesare and Lucrezia Borgia, often overshadowed his religious duties. King Edward II of England's close relationship with Piers Gaveston and later Hugh Dispenser led to rumors of homosexual liaisons. These friendships, coupled with his ineffective rule, led to his eventual deposition and murky end.